Well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is David Van Zant. I'm the president here at the New School, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to our keynote panel tonight, but also um, to our Center for Public Scholarship's 26th uh, Social Research Conference. Uh, the New School Center for Public Scholarship uh, was founded and led by our own uh, Professor Arian Mack. Um, it, it puts on the Social Research Conference Series, which was initiated in 1988. The mission um, of the center uh, is to enhance public understanding, influence ongoing uh, d debates about current social and, and uh, political issues, and finally, uh, publish papers. In fact, all of the papers that are being produced by this conference uh, tonight and tomorrow uh, will be published in social research and international quarterly. Well, we're here in this conference to discuss, uh, to discuss higher education, and uh, it's clearly a very timely uh, issue. I think the stakes are high not only for the universities themselves, but also for our, our society and our economy. Uh, I think the Occupy Wall Street movement, um, which we've um, uh, had both here in New York, but also across the country, uh, is, is simply a part of, of the entire issue that we're facing. Uh, personally, thank you. <laughs> uh, I didn't think I'd get applause for that, but thank you. Though. Um, personally, I, th I view the Occupy Wall Street mo movement, particularly among the younger generation, as a creed de corps uh, against what I think many of them perceive, and I think rightly, is di diminished expectations uh, for their careers, uh, for their job possibilities. Um, and that's compounded, of course, by higher education soaring costs, uh, which is saddling many of them with a, a crushing uh, burden of debt. There are important questions here such as whether and how higher education will survive, whether it's going to remain accessible um, to today's and tomorrow's citizens. And I think cost is only one of the issues. Um, some of the other issues include, is, is liberal arts education dying off? We certainly have a labor market that apparently uh, favors technical backgrounds. Um, there's been an enormous, uh, number in the, enormous increase in the number of students in higher education in the United States. But along with that has gone some fairly poor completion, uh, completion and graduation rates. Finally, there's international competition as other countries' higher education systems developed, sometimes modeling what we do here in the U.S. and sometimes taking a different, a different path. Um, there are certainly more questions. Uh, what is the privileged place, or is it a privileged place, a place for the Western universities? Um, are they the ones that are, that are the only ones going to be generating, generating knowledge? Uh, what is the role of higher education in developing informed citizens for democracy? A number of the founders of the New School um, did it in part because they believed the importance of higher education in developing democratic, democratic citizens. Finally, many of our universities uh, are undertaking efforts abroad, and we need to ask what are the benefits and challenges as, as some of these institutions expand, particularly when they go into, when they go into non-liberal, non-democratic uh, countries. We can see American higher education often as an arm of international development efforts, and we often view it as a chance to strengthen democratic ideals, but can we really, uh, can we really uh, uh, do that? Can we really export liberal uh, democratic ideas? Um, finally, how might uh, expansion abroad uh, change the U.S. model itself and impact its, its quality? I mentioned before one question, of course, is liberal arts, the liberal arts tradition. Will that emerge in these global contexts, um, even at the same time when it appears to be under threat here in the United States? And finally, I think this is true all over the world, what are the demands and effects, the, the effects of increasing demand for accountability and, and measurable outcomes? This conference uh, gathers uh, scholars and experts from around the globe to assess what's going on in higher education, determine what might intentionally be done to, to improve higher education, suggest some solutions, I hope, uh, that'll take account of the next 20 to 30 years, and finally identify and respond to the risks and ma maximize opportunities. Um, I want to take a moment to thank our supporters and co-sponsors for this conference, the Carnegie Corporation of New York and the Ford Foundation. Well, let's now turn to tonight's panel and, and to our issue. Our issue is what ought universities look like in 20 to 30 years. And I want to uh, welcome our distinguished panelists. I'll, I'll mention each of them, uh, not necessarily in the order they're sitting. Oh, yes, maybe it is. Uh, first is Jamshed uh, Barucha, who is the president of Cooper Union. Uh, Jamshed has written and lectured widely on challenges uh, facing higher education, emphasizing the need for bold innovations in learning and global engagement. 
He is a cognitive neuroscientist and has published extensively on cognitive and neural underpinnings of music. Prior to joining the Cooper Union last July, he served in senior academic leader positions, leadership positions at both Dartmouth College and Tufts, uh, Tufts uh, University. Uh, second is Matt Goldstein, the I chancellor. Uh, <laughs> you must cause allergies. Um, uh, uh, he's the chancellor of the City University of New York. He's the first, <laughs> thank you. He's the first CUN uh, CUNY graduate to lead the nation's most prominent urban uh, public university, which comprises 24 colleges and professional schools throughout the five boroughs of New York. Under his leadership, uh, CUNY has experienced a widely lauded transformation, um, and it's raised academic standards, improved student performance, incre <laughs> increased enrollment, um, built its faculty core, and creating new colleges and schools. Finally, he's a former president of Baruch College in Adelphi. Um, next is Neil Graboy, uh, who is the dean here of our very own Milano School of International Affairs, Management, and, and Urban Policy, part of the New School for Public Engagement. Neil is a former president of Colgate University, where he also served as a professor of mathematics. He's a former provost at Williams College. Um, he served the Carnegie Corporation for a period of time as vice president and director for strategic planning and program coordination. Uh, and most recently, he's been an adjunct professor of higher education at Teachers College, teaching a course on many of the issues facing, uh, facing higher education now. Finally, um, at the end of the table is uh, Bob Zimmer, Robert Zimmer, the president of the University of Chicago. He was appointed president in 2006. Uh, prior to that, he had been provost at Brown from 2002 through 2006. Uh, he had gone to Brown from the University of Chicago, where he'd been a member of the mathematics department and served in a number of administrative, uh, in administrative positions at, um, um, at the University of Chicago. So what I'm going to uh, start out by doing is, is it, first, I'm going to move over to my seat over here. Uh, thank you. And what I thought I'd do is to, to, to kick off this discussion, because we have many, many different topics here. But I want to throw, um, uh, if I can, if this is going to work. Oops, where's our, maybe I'm not going to be able to. Yeah, there we go. Just a couple, I want to just quickly give, provide, and maybe our speakers can look at this, a quick uh, overview of some of the issues or some of the facts behind higher education. The first graph here is really a chart that shows you how many more uh, people uh, in the age group from 25 to, to 34 have college degrees um, from, compared from 1940 until 2009. There's a steady increase in that. Also, in terms of projections, um, the orange lines are projections for 2025 20, as to how many people have bachelor's or, or graduate degrees as compared um, to other, other types of academic uh, qualification. Uh, we can come back to these charts if people have questions, but I just want to go through them quickly. There's, uh, this chart is, talks about the expenditures in the United States on higher education. We have increased the percentage of our GDP over time that we devote, uh, devote to um, higher education. And also, the United States, compared to uh, at least the countries I have on this list, a very reputable set of countries, uh, spends the, most, uh, the highest percentage of its G GDP on, on higher education. There's a lot of talk out there, and I think the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, has, um, is a result of this, as I mentioned before, of the, of the gap and, and actually increase in the gap uh, in median earnings between uh, uh, people with only high school degrees and those with uh, bachelor's degrees. Um, and it depends a little bit on what area of, of employment you're in, but uh, it's in every area there is that, uh, there is that gap. Uh, this is just another way of, of looking at it in, in terms of um, the type, again, the type of in, uh, employment that people are in. Uh, and finally, this gap is shown both in terms of median salaries that people have or median weekly income that people have, as well as the unemployment rate. This, this graph is particularly striking, and I think it, again, it, it captures the, the concern of the younger generation. It shows you the unemployment rates. I think the two most important lines are um, uh, two most important lines are, are one at the bottom, the black line for a bachelor's degree, and then if you go up and look at sort of the yellow green line for high school diplomas. While there's always been a gap between those two at much lower, lower levels of unemployment, 
that gap has widened uh, recently, and I think that's a, a, a trend that we have to a trend we have to deal with. Finally, is the issue of student debt, and this this one appeared in the Wall Street Journal a couple of months ago, which is, shows you that while the rest of America is trying to pay down its debts in terms of things like mortgage loans, auto loans, credit card loans, uh, revolving credit. Student loans, since the, really the start of the financial crisis, uh, have gone up 25%. And again, I mean, that, that, that's a positive thing in the sense that it indicates that Americans actually do value um, higher education. On the other hand, that's taking on an awful lot of debt in order to get, uh, in order to get that, that um, higher education. So I'd like to, I'd like to start out and, and maybe ask each of our uh, each of our participants, uh, do, they see, um, do they see an end to the rise in the cost of, of higher education and what's going to happen? I, I, um, uh, I probably won't go through and ask each person to answer every question, but if somebody uh, does have something I don't call on you uh, to, you'd like to talk about, please, uh, please, uh, please jump in. But why don't I uh, uh, start out by picking on, on Bob, Bob Zimmer at this end to say something about that. Yeah. So. First, I, and I just make a general comment about higher education uh, for virtually every one of these questions, which is that the higher education system in the United States is extremely non-homogeneous. Uh, there's a huge difference between uh, research universities, uh, college, liberal arts colleges, uh, two-year institutions, uh, between public and private. Uh, and the way in which issues get reflected through each one of these and the way changes in the world affect each one of these is actually rather different. So when we're talking about higher education, we are actually talking about uh, a whole bunch of different systems and they're each uh, creating different issues, uh, they're each responding differently, they're each being affected differently by uh, changes in the, amb in the ambient environment. Uh, so, uh, to my mind, the, uh, the largest uh, question here is uh, fundamentally about uh, uh, public institutions. Uh, I think that when you look at some of the leading uh, private institutions, University of Chicago, many others like us, whether research universities or uh, liberal arts colleges, that the a policy that these institutions have of uh, need-blind admissions, uh, meeting full need, has actually been quite a remarkable, uh, I believe, uh, policy in which as costs go up, they're fundamentally borne by those who can afford to pay it. And that is a, uh, is a fundamental issue. And when you look at these institutions and how they have been treating uh, student debt and so on, they've been uh, persistently, almost every one of them, driving this down uh, systematically over the last 20 years. So I think for a piece of the higher education system, there's actually quite a good story uh, to tell in that regard. Uh, the, the bigger stress, uh, of course, comes in uh, public institutions. Uh, the colleges and universities I've described are, are educating uh, a non-trivial number, but not a huge percentage of, of the students in this country. And uh, when you look at the public institutions, we're really confronting a, uh, to my mind, a fundamental question as to how much is the uh, public of the United States willing to support higher education as a public good? I mean, you have uh, the large state uh, the land-grant institutions in the Midwest, uh, the University of California, all of these are extraordinary systems that have had huge impact on this country, huge impact on the immigrant population and helping bring them into uh, the economic mainstream uh, of this country, and yet the nature of state and state ultimately means public uh, support uh, for these institutions is, is going down uh, very considerably, and those costs are being uh, transferred um, to individual students and driving up debt at a, uh, at a very significant rate. 
So I think this isn't. I think this is indeed a fundamental, uh, fundamental issue, and it's a uh, it's a societal issue. Well, why don't we turn to Matt, coming from that sector, the public sector? Uh, I, I'd like to just pick up on uh, some of the points that um, <clears throat> that Bob made uh, in 2008. And again, in 2010, I asked a number of the leading uh, presidents and chancellors of the top state universities to come to New York to discuss the future of public higher education in the United States. Um, there was a, uh, a commonality of view, uh, both in 2008 and 2010, and I think since then, the issues have become even more uh, exasperated. Uh, there is a constant, there has been a constant regression uh, of support away from public universities by state and local government. The data are irrefutable. And when we posit the view that the world is going to be unforgiving of people who come to a university that leave or don't leave uh, with the kinds of skills that they're going to need to compete uh, in an unforgiving economy, I view this as a true national security problem for the United States. Uh, not that our borders are going to be pierced by enemy combatants, but that our competitiveness is going to be seriously compromised unless we are able to find a new way of embracing public higher education. When you think that 82, 83 percent of the students who study at a college or a university in the United States today study at a public university, that graduation rates continue to soften, that students have to drop out in part because the obligation to fund the university is being transferred more on their shoulders as away from state and local government. This is a very serious movement that is happening and something that we have to take very seriously. Uh, and I don't have the answer. I mean, we came up with a very different funding model uh, about 2004 uh, that has incrementally helped CUNY uh, to become stabilized uh, in part because we emulated, and most public universities are doing this today, we emulated some of the practices uh, that have been uh, very much a part of the great public universities and some of the very fine, uh, some of the great uh, private universities and some of the very strong public universities by looking for different ways uh, to supplant or to uh, serve as catalytic events for developing new funding streams to support uh, what is happening in state local government. It's not enough. And I think if we want to continue to be competitive, if we want to be able to produce people who leave these universities highly skilled and able to compete in a very, very difficult environment, especially from students who are getting a very different experience elsewhere, then I think this really has to be a matter of public policy debate here in the United States to see if we can turn this around. Um, thank you. One, uh, you, you've heard a little bit about uh, where the, the source of funds to support higher education, but the other side of the equation, of course, is the cost of higher education. Um, Jean said, I wonder, uh, you've had to face that at Cooper Union recently, and do you see a ceiling to that? Or what, what, is, there gonna, is there gonna be a time when that's gonna moderate? The, the price has gone, the higher education index goes up much faster, has been going up much faster than the um, CPI. Yeah, I believe strongly that the cost trajectory is unsustainable. I think that universities are getting too expensive too fast. 
I just don't see how that can be sustained, <coughs> except perhaps by a few of the most wealthy uh, private institutions. Uh, and even then, I'm not so sure, but clearly they have more time you know, to, uh, to, to be able to <coughs> uh, deal with some of the challenges, but I think that they constitute a very small number of colleges and universities in this country. And as you come down f to the less wealthy institutions, even many highly selective institutions that are less wealthy, I just don't see the cost trajectory being sustained. And I would say that there are two issues that are really two sides of this coin. Uh, one is the question of access to those who can least afford it or those who have the least access because of circumstances of their birth and the kinds of uh, <coughs> schools they may not have been able to go to. And the second is really where the solutions are going to lie, and that is broadly innovation. And I'll talk just a little bit about each one. <coughs> I think access is as serious a problem today as it has been in this country since World War II. Uh, I think while many barriers have <coughs> uh, been lowered to access that might have existed in this country <coughs> in, in previous times, religious barriers, racial barriers, even still those barriers exist. I think the socioeconomic barriers <coughs> are probably more pronounced today uh, than certainly any time I can recall, not just in my uh, lifetime, but in my knowledge of uh, American higher education since World War II. And as the socioeconomic distribution in this country becomes more and more skewed uh, on the right side of the distribution, I guess from where looking, you're looking at it, that's the, the skew this way, in the sense that the, the rich become <coughs> much, much richer and the median household income in real terms, in inflation-adjusted terms, has not increased in the last 20 years, I think this becomes the, uh, the most serious uh, issue. The cost of the sort of sticker price at many private institutions is roughly equal to the median household income in this country, and that is a shocking uh, I think we're at a threshold, we're at a, at a, a pivot point uh, in that sense, because to imagine the sticker price to actually exceed uh, the median household income is, is, is something that's very difficult, certainly for me, to contemplate. And as I've thought about this, and having worked at uh, at least three institutions in, in leadership positions, three very different institutions, um, I think that the model has to change. The models have to change. And there I use the word innovation. And I don't just mean it in the usual sense in which it's used about technical innovation, although I include that as well. I'm talking about um, institutions having to become more entrepreneurial. And there again, I mean it in a broader sense, including social entrepreneurship. Uh, finding new ways to galvanize the skills and the talents uh, of the students, the faculty, the alumni, and the broader community. Here in New York City, for example, I mean, I would love to find uh, better ways to galvanize and leverage uh, all of the talent in the city to the benefit of our students in the city uh, in ways that maybe uh, go beyond just the sort of traditional ways of, of creating curriculum and so on. And I would say in the area of innovation, there are five quick points I'll just mention. I think infrastructure. I think uh, infrastructure has become the fixed cost associated with uh, infrastructures that institutions have been committed to. Um, are huge and very difficult to disengage from. And so I think the traditional sort of brick and mortar infrastructure uh, simply cannot continue to expand 
at a rate at which it has in the past. I think that the curriculum uh, uh, in all fields has to be really looked at almost from scratch uh, to see do we really need uh, to be sticking with curricula that are as rigid as they perhaps have been in the past. Might there be opportunities, as I said, to better leverage the strengths and the talents and, and the, the opportunities in a city like New York? Uh, pedagogy. Universities and colleges are the engines of innovation intellectually, but are extremely reluctant to innovate pedagogically and organizationally. And I think both of those need to change. Um, and I think that just finally, the way we even organize our institutions uh, administratively and academically need to really be looked at. But we do need to slow the growth of costs so that we can ensure that our education remains accessible to everyone. <clears throat> well, thank you. That actually leads right into uh, my next sort of question. Obviously, I'll, I'll pose this to Neil. I don't know if he knows this is coming or not. but. Um, <laughs> When you talk about innovation, I mean, I think a big issue is the cost of the delivery systems, how we teach, how we deliver education. And many, there are many for-profit institutions out there that have, for better or for worse, um, because of the profit motive, have tried to figure out how to do these things uh, more cheaply. Um, there are certainly issues uh, with the, with the for-profits, but Neil, do you see big changes coming in, in the way we actually do teach and deliver the education? I do, but I, I would like to put our conversation in a little bit of perspective in that uh, uh, higher education has been around for about a thousand years. It's uh, one of the few institutions that has in fact demonstrated the kind of strength that we're concerned about uh, today. But nevertheless, uh, there have been changes, but they've been very slow in the ways in which we teach. We're now uh, perforce worrying about the relationship between face-to-face -face education and education that may be more blended, that may be using technology. We're learning a lot about the cognitive structures and how they're affected uh, by learning. And we're seeing, for example, uh, new ways of teaching that are occurring at all levels of education. We're likely to be among the slowest to change. I think the notion of the conservatism of faculties is profound. And historically, at least in the United States, education, its delivery, and in fact, its subject matter have often been driven by students and not by faculties. Uh, faculties tend to preserve the style and understanding of teaching uh, from their own teachers. And we're now being faced with students who are looking at the world in rather different ways, sometimes ways that certainly make me feel uncomfortable. I'm not prepared to look at 14 images at one time with four different kinds of music and reading a book at the same time. Presumably, some of those things aren't making any sense. And whether or not this is a change in the kind of memes that, that uh, affect the way we look at the world, I don't know. But my guess is, as we look ahead and look at the incredible increases in the costs of education, at, uh, at, at certainly at, at all levels, but certainly at the higher education level, uh, we've brought it on ourselves. Uh, we've brought it on uh, in the sense that we have changed the way colleges and universities are structured. We have changed, we've shifted, in fact, from a notion of the social good that higher education provides to the private good. We are more and more educating for jobs, which presumably we'll have an opportunity to talk about mm -hmm. later and its relationship to a, a fuller education. Uh, in addition, higher education uh, tends to spend every penny of income they have. And consequently, uh, there is a continuing drive to increase the price uh, much faster much faster than the uh, CPI. And in fact, it was an invented a higher education price index to recognize that, of course, higher education is very different. And that's increased substantially more over time. Recently, it slowed down a bit in comparison uh, with the general CPI. 
And now in terms of what is likely to happen, uh, I think and worry that the distribution of wealth in institutions is going to dehomogenize the way education is provided. That the wealthiest institutions will continue to be able to provide primarily face-to-face -face education, and that the society as a whole will not be in a position to fund face-to-face -face education across the board. Uh, the so-called state universities are now not even called state universities, they're state-assisted institutions, and some have, I think, as little as about 8% of their budget covered by the state. Another issue uh, has to do with the price of higher education, and I would maintain that it should be much higher. And that may come as a strange view because, in fact, we don't have a real price. Uh, enormous percentages of students get aid, and the states that adopted a high price, high aid model, which they then changed to a high price, not very much aid model. But in fact, what the tuition is, is the maximum tuition. There's a limit on how much you can pay, even though for most institutions, the cost of educating a student is certainly higher than the price. And it is odd that as, a, as a institutions that have to f function through the flow of funds, that the usual model of uh, uh, a, an effective economic unit is that price minus cost should be relatively large. In higher education, it's negative. That we, did you pay for your education? I paid very little for my education, but it seemed like a great deal. And since it was 55, since it was 55 years ago, there was a different world. Uh, it yeah, seems, it seems we will have questions later. I, will be a chance uh, I, I'm not making excuses in, in one way or another. I'm simply saying that there are many people who can afford to pay the full cost of education and are not obliged to because the tuition is not the price that most people or many people pay. They are supported by the state. They're supported by endowments. Uh, they have a lot of supports that, in fact, uh, decrease beyond the cost what, in fact, uh, the price is. But all that aside for the moment, because we'll come back to these issues, I'm sure, uh, it's my sense that we will have a more widely distributed in the short term set of ped pedagogical approaches. We'll have a narrowing in the kinds of subjects that are taught. We will have a reduction in the purity of disciplines. And all of them will conspire to permit a variety of learning styles and provide accommodations to enabling people of different learning styles to in fact succeed. Uh, but a lot of it is going to depend on technology. Uh, we're just beginning to discover ways of using technology effectively, but we have a lot more to do. There'll be a lot more artificial intelligence buried in the ways in which uh, students engage with uh, lecturers who might be uh, delivered holographically or might be delivered uh, technologically in other ways. But we are, I think, at a cusp point or at a, a point of transition where the ways in which teaching occurs will become far more diverse and the mere cost of education will require that we are more imaginative about ways in which we teach. Um, Bob or, or Matt, do you want to comment on th those sorts of issues? Well, there are so many issues uh, uh, raised here. Um, let, let me just pick up one, uh, one thing, which is that I, uh, in terms of uh, creating non-homogeneous environments, I think we already have a non-homogeneous environment. And I actually think non-homogeneity is, is OK. I think, in fact, it's good. I think not every student wants the same thing. Not every student needs the same thing, type, type of education. One institution gives may not be the right uh, the thing for every student. So I, I do think that when you look at what has been a traditional strength of the higher education system here, it has been that there are 
many different avenues for students to potentially follow, to explore. And um, I, I'm not so worried about uh, the question of, of things being uh, non-homogeneous and people experimenting and evolving and some doing more and some doing less and one learning from the other and so on. I think that I, I don't, that not only doesn't worry me, but I think uh, is a positive. And, and the extent to which um, uh, stress creates experimentation, I think that's a good thing. I, I do think that, uh, to my mind, the fundamental uh, issue goes, really goes back to access. So you have a diverse system. There are various parts that will be more experimental. It's true some institutions will be more experimental uh, than others. Uh, there is a built-in um, uh, conservatism in, in pedagogy. I think that's... That's true, but it's not uniform, uh, it's not rigid, uh, different faculty, there are many faculty who love exploring it, and it'll vary from institution to institution. I think the main question is, is how are we going to be structured as a society so that students have access into the various pieces of, uh, of an evolving, a messy, and messy is fine, but people need to be able to have access into this structure in a way that uh, that is affordable for them. And that is, uh, is a fund, as I said before, I think a fundamental societal issue. Yeah. Matt? Yeah, yeah let, let me pick up on, on the notion of um, non-homogeneity, a, a totally different take on um, on an issue of, of non-homogeneity that is a real problem uh, in public universities, a real problem at a place like the City University of New York. And I refer to it as a tale of two tales, T-A-L-E of two T-A-I-L-S. What we're finding at CUNY and what we're finding throughout the state universities in the United States is that we're getting many more high achieving students that are ready for the most rigorous uh, and challenging kind of curricula our faculty are capable of delivering. And we want to do that for these students. But at the same time, we're getting a very strenuous and expanding lower tail of students. Students who are coming into state universities today woefully unprepared to address the challenges of higher education. And so it's a bimodal kind of distribution that is very expensive and very stressful for a university to do justice to. You want to take care of the students that need the assistance that they didn't get before they came and you also want to address the students that are ready to do very advanced work. And I would just like to explore one area very, very quickly and hope, uh, and it may not be, uh, the panelists that we have other than myself may not be as uh, involved as, as I find myself having to be. And that is the problem with the two tales is that we, as university personnel, faculty, administrators, must start getting involved in K through 12 education. Most professors at universities, other than those that are in teacher education programs, don't really think about K through 12 education. They just expect and want the students who arrive at their doors to be ready to do the work that they are prepared to challenge those students with. That is not happening. What is happening in New York and happening throughout the United States is that more and more students are graduating, but they are not college ready. They're not, they're not ready for university work. And we, as higher education, people must start paying attention to what happens 
in K through uh, 12 education. Because if we don't, it's going to have tremendous challenges for us to support the needs of these students and our cost structure is not devised in a way today to continue to deal with high variance and, and non-homogeneity. And I think it needs to be addressed. Yeah. And one of, the, uh, one of the impacts of what you're saying shows up in another question I wanted to ask, which I think is a, an issue for all of higher education, is are the graduation rates and retention rates. The number of people who complete a four-year degree in six years is is 60 percent, I think, across mm -hmm. the country, if I'm being, I'm maybe being too, uh, too generous about that. Um, is that a feature of is that a feature of the K through 12 system and what what we get? Is it something? I'm sure it's something we're doing as well. Um, do, do people anybody have a, a view on that? Uh, well, um, I'm, I may not because our graduation rates are very high. I may not be the right person to talk about that. But I, I would like to, if, if I may, uh, pick up on this point about um, K through 12 education. Uh, because I, I think it, it really is impossible to think about the higher education system in the United States without situating it inside the education system as a whole. We don't exist in total isolation. We get students that come with, uh, with a background and we are in fact part of their education. So looking at our position as being something that's divorced from and totally separate from K through 12 education is, is I think, a mistake. Um, and I, um, I agree with, uh, with Matt that I, I think the issue around K through 12 education is, uh, is an extraordinarily important one. And it's one of these problems where figuring out exactly how universities best participate in them is not entirely simple. Um, and at the University of Chicago, we've taken an extremely activist uh, role here with uh, our Urban Education Institute. We're running uh, four charter schools on the, um, on the south side of Chicago. Uh, and this is, uh, all students are admitted by, by lottery. And, and this has been an experiment for us, and it's been a successful experiment. And it's, it's been one of the ways that we've attempted to, to begin to engage this fundamental uh, problem. We have very rich partnership with the Chicago Public Schools. But this, is, this is, comes from a particular position of the University of Chicago, what we are particularly able to do, the nature of relationships that we have, our particular geographic location. But figuring out the right way for universities to engage this problem, and again, going back to the uh, messy argument, doesn't have to be the same for everyone, but somehow recognizing that we are part of a larger system and how we engage it. I, I completely agree with Matt that this is an important issue for us. If I could add one, one point about the responsibility of universities, generally speaking, universities are educating the next generation of teachers. And uh, that is a responsibility that, while accepted, was viewed to some extent as a cash cow. It wasn't terribly expensive to educate those students. And uh, I'm, I fear that we didn't give the same kind of attention to the education of the next generation of teachers that we might have done. Uh, that has clearly had an impact on the teaching force. Uh, we've made life very difficult for teachers. Uh, the, the likelihood of a teacher who enters the profession leaving five years later is very high. We have heaped on teachers' responsibilities that it's almost impossible for them to carry. Uh, and at the same time, we've said that teaching in the America is terrible, which makes it a very uncomfortable profession to enter. <coughs> and I think those are, if this, if this society is going to enhance uh, K through 12, it's going to have to do it through teachers. And since we spend an enormous amount in this country uh, on K through 12, it's not so much the money. The money is badly distributed, but the total amount of money is, is adequate. But I think we have to know more about how children learn. We have to be able to respond to their individual needs, which means we have to have a more effective teaching force. 
which means we have to be able to incentivize talented people to go into teaching. And we're not doing that, quite to the contrary. Um, well, as you could, I'm, trying, I'm trying here. Uh, we're, we have about 10 more minutes before I want to open it to um, questions from the floor. I've been trying to throw out a few issues um, uh, for discussion. And you know, using presidential prerogative, uh, everybody uh, it's, uh, is very good at, at answering maybe another one or sometimes the question I'm asking. But let me, <laughs> let me try one more. Um, and, and this, uh, John, I'll, I'll pose this one to you. Um, there's a lot of concern about uh, what we're teaching in higher education. That is, uh, there seems to be a race in many places towards highly professional, uh, professional education. Uh, on the other hand, there was a recent book, Academically Adrift, which, at least on one measure, um, suggested that whether it's a business administration course or something you know, more uh, technical in, in regard, it didn't do as well in terms of preparing students, say, in critical thinking as uh, a liberal arts education. Um, how do you feel about it? Which way should we be going in that, given the needs of the economy and, and, and society? Yeah, I think, uh, particularly at a time of economic stress, that there will be a great temptation to abandon the liberal arts and to try to become more vocational. And I have to say that um, it's very, very important for us to understand that, that the liberal arts, and when I say that, I mean liberal arts broadly in the sense of getting a, a broad-based edu education that challenges you to think um, critically and creative, creatively and, and to uh, ask difficult questions. That is perhaps more necessary at a time of economic strife than, uh, th than otherwise. Because in fact, that's, it's, it's, it's the creativity, the originality, uh, that uh, a broad-based education, at least at the undergraduate level, uh, you always have the chance to you know, specialize, but at the undergraduate level, that has always been the strength of this country. Uh, and I can tell you, having grown up you know, in another country where the education is very, very specialized, very early, that you, you do lose uh, this uh, broader context, which as you get older, starts to manifest itself in more and more powerful ways. Uh, creativity is essentially connecting diverse dots that other people have never connected before. And if the dots you're learning about are all within a little <laughs> silo, most of those dots have been connected. But you'll see from in the last, I'd say, several decades, both in the sciences as well as in the arts and the, and the social sciences and other fields, the, the truly ori new original ideas that have changed our thinking and that have established new industries and so on have come from connecting a dot here with a dot there. That comes from a di diversification of experience. So I really hope, and this is a uniquely American thing, I uh, really hope that we stick to our guns here and, and remember that it's creativity, originality, uh, critical thinking in, in the broadest sense, learning how to learn, adopting a sense of a lifetime habit of learning uh, that uh, is going to carry us through in the end. But let me just say, I also think that our modes of teaching are in many respects obsolete and that we really do need to innovate. Uh, a, a story I often like to tell is one of, uh, uh, illustrates the fact that the secret, the dirty little secret about learning is that we forget. And uh, I say this as a, with my cognitive psychology hat on. A student enrolls in a course, and we teach them stuff, and they, they learn more, and they learn more, and they learn more, and at the end, you know, we stamp a grade, and they carry that grade off with them forever, as if somehow, they've, you know, all of this knowledge now is in their brain, and that they, it's, it's accessible to them forever. But in fact, if this is the learning curve over time, the forgetting curve is like that. It's extremely dramatic. And uh, uh, I... I conduct a little informal experiment at alumni reunions, and when I was teaching at Dartmouth, I um, 
taught there long enough that I could actually get to see students at 10th year reunions and so on. And I remember a student at, my, at his 10th year re reunion, very, very smart student, he came up and said, Professor, remember me, I took your course on memory. <laughs> 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 and I did remember him. And uh, this was in the psychology department. And, and you know, we chit-chatted, and he was very, very successful on Wall Street and so on, had gotten A's. And I said, so what do you remember? And this extremely bright, successful person became completely incoherent. And he said, well, you know, like stuff, you know, <laughs> stuff about memory. And, and <laughs> uh, they, I can tell you as a cognitive and brain scientist that the way we teach, for the most part, is uh, greatly under, uh, uh, under states. It, in some sense, and is, and is really mistuned in many ways to the ways in which our brains learn. We need more active forms of learning. We need more contextualized forms of learning. Uh, and um, we need uh, to, to make sure that the precious time in a classroom, whether it's a seminar room or a class this size, is used in a much more dynamic way than is historically done. Yeah. Well. Um, <coughs> What I, I had a list of uh, issues and questions to ask our, um, our panel, but maybe I'll just open it up before we, uh, to, to all of you. Is there an issue that um, we haven't discussed that you'd like to raise and say something about? Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd just like to uh, comment again very briefly on this question about uh, a liberal arts, uh, particularly given uh, the nature of the University of Chicago and its, uh, it, its particular representation and belief in the liberal arts environment. Uh, I just gave a, um, the annual address at the college board where I basically spent 45 minutes ad uh, addressing this question. And I just wanted to pick up one word that was just used, and that, that's the word context. Uh, because the, the model around employment that that training for employment means you're going to learn a little something. You're going to learn a lot about a little something. And that is what is going to prepare you for work is actually, to my mind, just not correct. Uh, that one actually needs in whatever you're going to be doing to actually start understanding context, how your specialization fits in to a larger context. And what that means is you actually need to be able to look at things from somebody else's perspective. And there's a whole set of, uh, let me say, habits of mind or cognitive skills that need to be developed in order for even specialized knowledge to be effectively applied over time. And a lot of that has to do with context. So I'm not going to reprise my whole speech here, but I did just want to say that I, I do think there, the arguments about the liberal arts as being a, uh, enriching for you as an individual are important. The arguments about them around uh, creating uh, democracy and participatory citizenship are important, but the assumption that it's somehow uh, antithetical or not contributing to people's capacity for work, I think, is just totally off base. And I think liberal arts done right is an extremely powerful preparation for work. But I refer you to my speech, which is on the College, <laughs> college Board site. So. Well, actually, Neil, I was going to ask you to comment on this, yes. um, in part because uh, I just want to play the cynic. If I'm, if I'm a, a, a young applicant with parents, uh, who, particularly in this economy, who are concerned about it, and I hear both of you talking this way about the liberal arts, you know, it, it almost has an otherworldly feel. I feel like, well, you know, that's what you were used to, that's what you like, uh, that's what you do now in teaching, and, um, but why should I buy into that when I need a job, Neil? Well, first, it seems to me uh, that the data are pretty clear that most Americans are going to be working in probably as many as six different areas over the course of one's life. I would suspect that every one of us at this table and everybody out in the audience has done many different things, earned a living in many different ways. Uh, what is going to prepare us to do that? 
it seems to me, two things. One is uh, capacity to continue to educate oneself over a lifetime. And one is a, an opportunity to get started. And it seems to me that the, those two pieces have to be considered together. Uh, that the liberal arts will have a more profound effect, in my view, on a lifetime of learning and work, but beyond work, beyond work, also the nature of how one live, lives one's life. But that to get started, I'm reminded of the fact of a CEO who had himself a liberal arts education, came to talk to a bunch of students, and talked in these oratund uh, ways about the importance of the liberal arts. And we asked, who does the hiring in your company? And he said, well, human resources does the hiring. Who do they hire? Well, they hire accountants, and they hire specialists in particular areas that that particular company is involved in. So we have this disconnect between what you need to get that first, that first opportunity and what you will need over the course of your life to live the kind of rich life but fulfilling one that may not be in one particular area forever. And how to find the right mixture, uh, whether students really ought to learn how to be mechanics as well as to learn Plato, I don't know. But uh, I do think that we can't ignore the fact that our students will go on to get some kind of job, but that it won't be the only job and the only way they'll be able to function effectively in the society is to be able to master new techniques, new knowledge, new ideas, and to build on that kind of imaginative uh, structures that are enhanced by, the, by the, say, the study of philosophy, even Wittgenstein. Yeah. I'd like to... Um we could comment a little bit more on this, and, uh, but, but while, while you're doing that, if any uh, people in the audience have questions, please come down, uh, to, please come down to, the, to the microphone. So, oh, we got a quick reaction there. Uh, why don't we start right here? Yes. Uh, oh, could you, by the way, could you please keep your questions short. Absolutely. And tell us who you are and, and something, you know. Uh, Jerry Spivak, and uh, just uh, as has been noted, um, we've just ended World War III during which the armies of the well-to-do have colonized and taken the resources and wealth of the defeated middle and poorer classes. Why are we not calling for a Marshall Plan to redistribute the wealth back to the defeated classes as we did after the last major conflict, World War II? Uh, I'm asking as public intellectuals, as people who are running the universities, why you're not calling for this? Is it at all because the donors are that very class that has taken the wealth, or is it for some other purpose or reason? I'm glad Thank I'm you. the moderator. Anybody want to answer that one? <laughs> oh, I, I, I'd be happy to. I, I, uh, I think there needs to be a societal effort as, as strong as the Marshall Plan to invest in education and to make sure that the investments are focused on making sure that those who have the least access, and, and access means a lot of things because it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to gain access if you haven't had you know, the right kind of K through 12 preparation. Absolutely, I think that uh, looking at, at what you know, is spent on, on uh, wars and what's spent on you know, a lot of other things, uh, we, it seems to me, of course I'm biased as an educator, that, that if we put those kinds of resources into education, we wouldn't even be needing to have this discussion. We would enable all uh, students and even uh, adults later in life who wish to further their learning to do so. My guess is you probably get the same answer across the board of yeah. the panelists here. So. Uh, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the expansion of, of the number of administrators involved in, uh, at colleges and also the expansion of the, uh, the compensation of the administrative slash executive class that's been in the news quite a bit. You know, I, uh, let, me, um, let me respond uh, at least uh, with with Judy was free. Judy was free for over a hundred years. For over a hundred years. If Judy continues in the direction, if Judy continues in the direction, that gold scene is pushing it. The gold scene is pushing it. Working class, black and Latino youth. Working class, black and Latino youth. You have less access to higher education. You have less access to higher education. Adjuncts will work with for little pay. Adjuncts will work for a little pay. And class will be taught almost entirely by them. And class will be taught almost entirely by them. Uh, 
Okay. Um, future of education. These pamphlets oh, uh, of the future of education come at the expense of the future of the accessible public education for all. Come mm -hmm. on, just go on. Okay. okay. Um, thank you. Do you want to try? Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I, uh, in response to your legitimate question, let me, um, let me give you the CUNY experience. Uh, since 2002, so we're looking at nine years, the City University has done what I think is without precedent any other place in the United States and has added over 1,700 faculty. That has been our largest investment that we have made uh, other than capital construction of very, very expensive I facilities. I check. Okay. Yeah. And I think that is something that we're uh, deeply proud of, and we're going to continue to do it as, uh, as the years progress. Relative to the number of administrators, at least at, at the City University of New York, that pales in a percentage basis to, to what we've seen uh, in faculty. And with respect to the woman who talked about health care, uh, all of our full-time faculty uh, have health care, uh, and we certainly will never do that uh, to undermine that. We do have a class of adjuncts, part-time faculty, that um, are about 1,800 out of the maybe 11,000 uh, adjuncts that we have at the City University that were in jeopardy of losing their health care because the welfare fund which uh, administers those costs uh, would be near bankrupt unless there bankruptcy unless there was some uh, very uh, aggressive intervention, and I made it very clear that in our budget request, one of our highest priorities were to be to make sure that that um, would not happen, and I'm fairly confident that that it won't happen. And I made the pledge that uh, we would do that. And I'm, and I'm pretty confident that we will be able to, to deliver on that pledge. But there is, um, there, is an issue, there is an issue at some places that administrators are far outpacing the acquisition of talent uh, that we would place in classrooms. That has not been the case at CUNY by any stretch of the imagination. I don't know. I can't speak for any other institutions. So I'm actually going to go a little different direction. Um, you folks uh, represent half a dozen or a dozen universities you've worked at, and you know many other university leaders. I guess my question is, to what degree are you folks, and how are you going to change the way your organizations operate? You have tenured faculty. You know what? If they don't do a good job in the business world, you fire someone. That doesn't work so well here. I'm not saying that's necessarily a response, but you have a very static, very staid organizational structure. Who promotes, what does it take to be a president of a university? Not if you're a good administrator, although many of you may be, and I don't sort of suggest that, but it's you're voted by your faculty, the people who don't necessarily know how to administrate themselves. So, I mean, some of the, the you know, what, what percentage do you spend on people, um, you know, you want to I innovate on IT? How much do you pay top for top IT talent to come in and innovate? versus what you pay a faculty who just knows a very narrow discipline and may be very good. To what degree do you have the organizational capacity or are you growing it to actually innovate and change? There don't, people don't have to show up to lectures to be educated. The, the stage on stage can be broadcast on YouTube and you could do other things to sort of innovate. So I haven't really heard that and I'm sure a lot of it's going on and that is the future of higher education. So if you could sort of you know, share with us some of the things that are happening or that are not happening or preventing that to happen, I think that would uh, sort of speak to the topic of the, tonight's talk. Sure, I, I, I did say in my remarks earlier, I think we need innovation of all kinds, including organizational innovation and including administrative innovation. The administrative structures that were in place 20, 30, 40 years ago may not necessarily be the most appropriate. 
uh, it's possible that one could have flatter administrative structures today uh, that are, I mean, in the end, the whole purpose of structure and organization is to serve the mission of the institution uh, in terms of advancing education, advancing knowledge, public service, and the kinds of things that, that uh, colleges and universities should be focused on. I do think that um, there are many aspects of the academy where practices and policies uh, have, to some extent, lost sight of the fact that, in the end, it's the, it's the, it's the learning experience of the student, it's the expansion of knowledge, uh, it's making the world a better place. That is the reason why we're here. And, and I really firmly believe that every decision that we make uh, uh, has to be focused on those things. And I think there are a growing number of faculty members who are eager to innovate, who are eager to cross traditional boundaries, uh, traditional disciplines, who are eager to look at new ways of, of teaching and working with students in new ways. And, and I think that those who are motivated to do so can be engaged, and I think it'll be a growing critical mass uh, as we go forward. If I may add something to that, uh, at, at times of stasis, when the economy is going along okay and one hopes we're not in wars or having external pressures of a profound sort, uh, institutions tend to chug along the way they have in the past uh, with pedagogical change, most unlikely, but academic change, intellectual change, change at the margins of various specialties, producing new ways of looking at the world. It seems to me that at times of uh, dramatic change in economies or in a sense of uh, self-confidence, uh, that's, that's the time when pedagogical changes are uh, almost imposed on us by the world outside ourselves. And I happen to think that we have been in moments like that uh, in the past uh, when we moved from everybody studying Latin and Greek and nobody studied French or German uh, to a moment now when the financial pressures are such that we have to be rethinking the pedagogical approaches that are so important to, to our students, both because they are pushing us to make changes that are more in keeping with their learning styles, and because we have some of the tools that we haven't had in the past. So I think we're, we're at, a, at a cusp no moment right at the moment, right now, where in fact uh, pedagogical exploration, which has not been incentivized or rewarded all that much, will be more rewarded uh, because it's going to be more important to the success of the institutions. Can, can I just add? Uh uh, one thing uh, to this, which is in a rather different direction, uh, and they, because the question of tenure uh, was raised. And again, I think there's a huge variety of institutions, and everyone has to uh, figure that out for themselves. But uh, one of the crucial reasons for tenure in the first place uh, was not so much as an employment issue, but around the question of uh, protecting academic freedom, which is the capacity of uh, faculty to, uh, to teach from a perspective that they want to teach and not have political pressure brought uh, to bear on them. Uh, this is, uh, to my mind, something that one uh, can never uh, lose sight of and never lose sight of the importance of this. One can argue as to whether tenure is necessary to create an environment for that. Uh, but I would say that the tenure structure uh, has been a one vehicle that has been effective in doing this. And, uh, it, it's a very, very easy thing to take for granted. Uh, the fact that somebody can walk in, uh, talk about their field from whatever uh, uh, position uh, that they want to, uh, whatever perspectives they may have, and the person down the hall is going to do it in a totally different way, and that's all fine, and that's all good. 
This is not, I mean, you're talking about the difference between an academic environment and business environment. This is not the standard way that the world operates. Uh, and universities have striven, many universities, uh, to maintain this. And uh, uh, Jonathan Cole, who's sitting here, the uh, former provost at um, Columbia, had a very interesting uh, conference about this a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a subject that many of us uh, are concerned about and, uh, and focused on. And I would just say, before one gets too excited uh, about anything regarding uh, universities that uh, the this free and open uh, discourse and the structures that have supported it are absolutely essential and should not be toyed with too quickly. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Peter Lynch. I'm a graduate of Cooper. I've taught at Parsons, the new school, and taught at City College, and um, also as a department head, another institution. All of those radical institutions when they were formed. Um, I hear uh, Dr. Baruch's call for innovation, and I wonder, how are you going to do it? I mean, at one moment, there, were, uh, there was a crisis. There were new institutions. Now we have credentialing. We have much more of a professional emphasis on education. So some of those models won't be so easy to, to implement. So. How far are you willing to go? If it's just tweaking, it's not going to get us where we need to go. Well, I have to deal with that every day because we're called the new school. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think it's, your point's well taken. So. Yeah, I think you've put your finger on perhaps the key challenge. And I wish I had easy answers. I'd love to know, you know, maybe afterwards we can, uh, some of your thoughts. That is the key challenge, is when the most... Uh, dramatic kinds of innovations are needed because the world is changing so fast because we have all of this, you know, the, the economy is, is in trouble and we have to find ways to, 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 to get America working and to be competitive when we need to innovate very quickly and yet the institutional inertia and the inertial forces are very, very many, as, as you suggest. Uh, how do we uh, bring sort of these inertial forces uh, up to speed. I have lots of ideas, but uh, I think that would, <laughs> that would take a while. But I do think that's the key issue, and for for uh, colleges and universities, the most difficult challenge: how do we find ourselves? How do we change as fast as we need to change to meet the demands of a uh, our population, but also a, an increasingly diverse population, which we need to serve in new kinds of ways. Just one example, yeah. you're most radical. Just one example. I, yeah, I do think that, that the, uh, a more uh, vibrant, multidisciplinary uh, projects uh, for students uh, and for faculty uh, would go a long way. We, our curricula tend to be very structured within departments and within schools. A lot of people talk about multidisciplinarity, but it's been actually very difficult to get it to work. And, and, and I think that getting uh, students coming from different disciplines, working collaboratively on projects that actually have outcomes and things that you make. We're talking about at Cooper Union. I mean, an engineer and an artist and an architect, why shouldn't they work together and actually make something together? And faculty actually do something together. Uh, that's the kind of thing that will get people out of their traditional silos. And I think that that is going to be one of the major challenges that we face in higher education, understanding that some of the most interesting and compelling questions find themselves on the boundaries of disciplines. And the degree to which we can pierce the silos that American universities have grown uh, with to be pierced and create channels where we create new disciplines as a result of merging ideas and theory and practice uh, among disciplines is going to be a major challenge for higher education. To avoid embarrassment uh, to our president, 
uh, or I'm hearing only advertisements for the new school. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this is uh, questions mainly for uh, Chancellor Goldstein. Um, I'm a retired professor from CUNY, and uh, I taught at CUNY for a good th over 30 years. And from the time I began teaching, it was late 60s, I've seen a tremendous deterioration of the liberal arts, despite what you said before. CUNY is deteriorating in terms of the coursework in liberal arts. There are courses in the languages, there are courses in the humanities that are atrophying, particularly in, in the smaller colleges. The other thing, you, you spoke a, a big, uh, a, a lot about the K through 12, how you're interested in K through 12. Then why did you end remediation at the senior colleges, which was an attempt, which was an attempt to remediate the poor education that a lot of these inner city kids got from high school. That was their last chance, remediation at the senior colleges. Thank you. No, I'm, I just have a, a question, couple more. please. Okay. You've the other got a couple in. What really bothers waiting. me, Chancellor Goldstein, is that the Board of Trustees, when I look at the Board of Trustees, and particularly when I look at the chair, who is a major privatizer in charter schools, you have an enemy of public education as our board chair. I think that is a disgrace. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Say. Uh, I think Ben O'Schmidt is a, a very fine man, and I think he cares deeply about the City University of New York, and I think under his leadership and with me working with him, uh, the university is a much better place than it was maybe uh, 10 or a dozen years ago, on any metric that you want to look at. Hi, uh, Tarek Bulat. Um, my question is, uh, the online for-profit sort of putting aside the controversy uh, that, that they have, uh, they have uh, garnered, they've shown that you're able to both expand access and deliver education at a fraction of the cost of, of brick and mortar schools. Do, do, do any of your schools, have, especially uh, CUNY, uh, have any plans to sort of build out an online degree program uh, that can kind of hammer down the price and also uh, serve sort of the non-traditional you know, students. I think technology in general is going to be a theme that's going to course through uh, the next several years uh, at, at all of our institutions. Uh, and City University of New York, uh, in, in particular, has a very big stake uh, in not only online education, which is uh, expanding tremendously, but in innovating pedagogy uh, in ways that um, are really right on the, on the cusp of, of new knowledge that is being created by neuroscientists and, and people uh, in um, IT in ways that we can only imagine at this particular point. And so the answer is yes, and it's, it's going to uh, be explosive uh, in the next few years, I think, at all of our institutions. Is it, but is it more likely to happen at for-profits versus not-for-profits? I think that was part of your question. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, for-profits, if you look at um, their balance sheets, and I've seen some of them, uh, it, their, their profitability is very much based on uh, cost structures that don't invest very heavily in people. Uh, they have very few full-time faculty. Uh, they're mainly adjunct faculty, and they do an awful lot of technological innovation, which has a big upfront cost, but you, when you amortize that cost over a period of time, the cost structure uh, makes them much more uh, as enabling uh, to be able to do things where their profitability goes up. I mean, it's a cost structure that all the universities could have. I'm sorry? It's a cost structure that all of the universities could have. They could, they could make the upfront right. investment. Yes. They made that yeah. investment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sir? Hi. Um, my name is Brittany. Why don't you move the mic down? Okay. Right Hold there on. We Here we go. Hey, um, my name is Brittany. I'm a student at Megar Evers uh, University. Um, I'm sure you probably have never heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, and Matt, you've probably forgotten about us. Yeah. So. Um, 
I, I just wanted to just make a point really quick. Uh, we have. I hope it has a question a, on the end. No, well, I, there's a question. Okay, I, right. Just a quick point okay. that we have a <laughs> panel of five people um, talking about the future of higher education. Mm -hmm. They are all male, mm -hmm. even though the majority of people in college right now are female. Whatever that means. But anyway, so um, you brought up a good uh, a good um, question about how higher education um, universities should start looking at K through 12 and what's going on there. Um, so, and CUNY as a as a um, as it started was supposed to serve the community, but at the same time uh, in New York we have hundreds of failing public schools. Um, and they're typically in low income in minority neighborhoods uh, where kids have historically had low SAT scores and have high high school dropout rates in GD uh, diplomas. So isn't raising tuition, um, closing open admission, and doing away with direct admission um, contradictory to the mission of CUNY? And there is clear favorism of certain CUNY campuses um, such as Hunter, Brook, and Brooklyn College. Good. I think you've got. Um, that's so, a pretty good question. Uh, yeah. So I mean, like, yeah. I mean, it's it's contra so so. And then to play off what someone said before, how higher education, we should start looking about the the social good that we can create from higher education. How is CUNY going to help the social good of the New York City? as a whole. I guess that's my question. Thank you. Well, well, let me, let me, you, you touched on so many areas. Let me talk about K through 12. We now run about 27 high schools uh, at, at CUNY, uh, intimately involved in public education. Uh, we have relationships with about 208 high schools uh, in, in ways that I don't think any other university does. So we are intimately involved but not as much as we should be, because I think unless the K through 12 system in New York is enabling students to be ready when they come to Medgar Evers College or to Queens College or any of the 24 campuses mm -hmm. that make up the City University of New York, it's going to be impossible for us to do what we're capable of doing because we just need the students to be at, a, at an elevated level. And that's why so much of our resources are being devoted now to working with the DOE to help uh, maximize the opportunity that those students will succeed. Thank you. Okay. Um, but, um, uh, 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 Megar Evers College is we, actually the only community wanted and needed uh, school in the CUNY system. CUNY didn't want it there. Thank you. Um, but thank we have a president now who says that he's, his main concern is not, he, he said that he doesn't want to run a black college, even though it's a historically black college. But I just want to leave you with that. And we have a provost who's inappropriate and is sexually harasses people. Right. Thank you. <laughs> what can I say? Yeah. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Kathleen. I'm an NSP undergraduate student, um, 26. Um, it's taken me about eight years to get here. Um, there, across the board, there was a lot of mention of the word competition about and preparation sort of used in conjunction. And I think that superficially looking at some of the numbers and the graphs that were flashed before our eyes that that could kind of be considered important. Um, but what about the idea that uh, preparing us for competition for a big, bad, adversarial world is passe, and that maybe, maybe we should talk more about creating empowerment, integration, and sort of a allowness for each individual student to be that big, beautiful butterfly or whatever hippy-dippy thing. Um. Well, I, th I don't know if anybody wants to comment, but I think that's what many of us believe. I mean, that's exactly what we should be doing. Now, we may not do it well, but anybody? It seems to me as a, as a system, to the extent that American higher education is a system, its obligation, it seems to me, is to enable people to fulfill their potential to enable them to take advantage of their own skills, interests, and take them as far as possible. Um, but people also have to earn a living, and we have obligations to help people do that as well. 
May I and ask And that's that a difficult, a difficult uh, a balancing act, but both Absolutely. parts are important. May I ask that when competition was mentioned, uh, who are we competing with? With our fellow graduates, with other countries, or with the environment in general? Competition was mentioned in what, what context? Um, like saying that saying that you could create a student or a graduate, a person who is more well prepared to compete. Oh, okay, good, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, well, what, we were at 7:30, and so I, I need to I need to stop it. I need to stop it now. But I want to thank each of our panel members um, for their ideas and for their oh, contribution yeah. to this. I'm going to have to ask the question. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm a done, graduate but... of Parsons and of Rhode okay. Island School of Design, mm -hmm. and I'm a PhD at the CUNY Graduate Center right now. Oh. And I have chicken scratch here. And one question, I'll answer it real quick because it was ignored by someone who just went before me. Before I ask this question, I need you to look at each other because it kind of reiterates um, what was just brought up. Mm -hmm. I see that you're not looking at each other, so I'll just go ahead and ask it. I'd like to hear what your 20-year, 30-year plan is um, in order to avoid this type of representation um, in the future so we don't just have your Cylon doubles, of, for those of you that know Battlestar Galactica, um, Cylon doubles in 20 years. My mom um, is a principal, a PhD, and teaches you know teachers how to teach. And there's a lot of women who could be on this panel right now. The second quick question is for um, Chancellor Goldstein. Um, you mentioned earlier, um, and this is a we, paraphrase, we, yeah, we but the failure here, of so. education in your school is a national security issue. Is this the justification that you go to bed with at night in the surveying, surveying and surveillance of Muslims, Muslim students on the CUNY campuses? So that's just a really quick question. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Arian Mack, Arian Mack. I want to address only one issue. Okay, I think we're. I, we're going to have to end. You have to. That we're going to do this all day tomorrow. You're welcome to come and ask your questions then. But I do want to answer, since I am the organizer of this conference and responsible for what you're seeing before you, which is a very male. Uh, what about putting? Could you? Excuse me. Excuse me. Thank you, everyone, and hopefully we'll see many of you tomorrow. <laughs>